Hey, welcome to the CTO studio. I have someone awesome in the studio today, Tony Carter, founder, one of the founders of the LA CTO Forum, established in 2001. Also a big reason and model for me starting seven CTOs. So I really consider these guys the blueprint. We talk about a couple of his startups and some ideas around publications. Take a listen. I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like you. Welcome to the CTO studio. I'm your host, Etienne de Bruin. The CTO studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products with incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? CTO Studio today has someone very special, someone I really look up to, someone who inspired me to create our community of CTOs. So I'm going to get deep into that. Tony Carr, thanks for being in the CTO Studio. Thanks for having me. Great I'm to be in, here. I'm in Los Angeles. Yeah, this we, is, uh, we have brought rain for you. <laughs> I feel like you know, driving up here, I felt like... Why am I so nervous to talk to people that I talk to every day? And I realized it's just that sort of innate response to unfamiliarity and like I'm in someone else's turf. Hmm. That's interesting because uh, the like CTO this, group here is so open. So yes. it's, it's, uh, it's funny. The LA CTO Forum. So you founded that. It's one of the founders of it. There's, there's a small group. And how did, tell me how that happened. Actually, it's... It's kind of funny. So um, there was a conference way back in the day put on by InfoWorld back when that magazine existed. And uh, they did a national conference and then they decided, hey, let's create little local CTO <coughs> groups. And so that inspired a group of us to create a group here in LA. And they, they went kaplooey soon afterwards. But we found so much value uh, in just having it. Originally, it was like maybe eight of us. And so you'd get together in a room, you talk about what your problems were, and you get feedback from each other. And then it just slowly started growing over time and, you know, and, and just kept started adding content to it and doing all sorts of stuff. And it's just grown kind of organically. And it's been, it's been a long time, right? 2001. That's started. beautiful. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's but a part of your DNA. It is. And it's, it's such incredible value. So this last year with GDPR coming around, I was a little late to the game for my publishing company and trying to figure out, okay, what do I, what do I really need to do here? And there's so much theory out there, but in practice, what do I really need to do? And so one of the uh, CTOs, John Zerden from uh, Exos, had done a lot of stuff on GDPR, much more complicated problem than us. But he's like, okay, hey, I know just the guy you should talk to and let's offer it up to everybody in the group. So we had a group of about 20 of us get together with this expert. He went through it and then, uh, I mean, he just helped me through the whole process. And, and like, I don't even know how I've gotten through GDPR without his wow. help. So, I mean, and that just came from me, you know, sending a message out to the group saying, hey, you know, what are people doing about this? Please help, you know, and yeah, I, uh, as a, as, so I live in San Diego and we, we have people driving up every month for your meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, a few, not, not many. You, you've done a good job down in San Diego, great in a, Thank you, yeah. a similar kind of environment. So it's, it's, it's interesting because technology people have sort of this weird rap about them, you know, like you wouldn't think they'd be good in this kind of environment. Mm. And yet I think fundamentally we're all problem solvers. Mm. So give me an interesting problem and, uh, you know, and I'm happy to help you with it. And uh, uh, have, so with such history, uh, have you, what has the ebb and flow been like for this community? Because community building is, is very hard. I mean, it's something that has inertia. It's something that you're more excited about sometimes than other times. Sure. As, 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 and I'm speaking from my own experience. How, how did you decide to just stick with this for so long? Well, it gives me tremendous value back. So that, that certainly helps. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it happens and flows. Uh, there's kind of a core group still. Actually, it's a large core group now, probably about 20 of us who are involved in organizing it in one way or another. Mm. And so, you know, as one person gets super crazy busy, then the next person can kind mm. of step in. And so it's, it's never felt like that much of a chore. It's something I, you know, I don't have dedicated time for. You just kind of find little pockets of time here and there to, to, you know, organize things. Mm. And, uh, and certainly I get more excited about certain aspects at certain times, mm. but, uh, mm. but it's, it's a great group of people 
real interesting content, tremendous value. And so it, it, you know, it pays for any of the time yeah, I spend. No, on it. I, uh, uh, I mean the reputation, anybody I talk to, uh, you know, the conversation almost always comes up, especially if they're in LA or Orange County, the, you know, LA CTO forum as a, as a sort of a bedrock for, or at least a solid starting place to just at least get connected. I, uh, I was able to tell two young CTOs today about it. Oh, wow. They, uh, they didn't know about it. And I was like, how is that possible? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're really bad at uh, getting the word out. And CTOs are not the most aggressive networkers, yes, right? So, yes. uh, but um, we've, we actually have uh, kind of remote locations going on at a few, few different saw, geographies. Yeah, so. I saw, um, I think I saw a tweet about it or something. Mentorship programs, that, that multiple as well. locations. Yep, yep. Are those locations uh, breaking f- out of LA or um, is it mostly S- Santa Barbara, Orange County, Pasadena <coughs> are kind of the, you know, the far distances. And then we've got a few that are a little closer and each one forms its own little group of much like uh, how we originally started. So, you know, eight mm. to 10 kind of originally, and then they, um, they can participate <coughs> in the larger group, but then they also have sort of their own, their own vibe to them. Do you often or sometimes find that there are seven CTOs who? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are. <laughs> so uh, Tech Empower. Yeah. Tell me about that. Uh, well, it's been a great. It's been a long, again, yeah, it's long, been a long. Yeah, 1997 is when I started incredible. it. So, and it really, it kind of came out of my experience. So I was a CTO at two startups in the early 90s. Where, where are you from, by the way? Uh, California desert originally, uh, there's a big Navy base out there, um, called China Lake Naval base, Okay, fly around all the jets and all that kind of stuff okay. out there and shoot, shoot missiles off. Uh, so I grew up there. My dad worked on the Navy base and, uh, and that was actually my first computer job was on the Navy base as well. And so then I went to school at LMU and, uh, and then ended up teaching at LMU later. And so LMU is kind of core part of my life. Actually tech and power started out of LMU. Um, you got your PhD at LMU? Uh, no, PhD is at USC. Oh, USC, okay. And, uh, and, but I was... Oh, so Tech Empower came out of LMU. Well, yeah. Uh, so, so basically, so I had two... So while I was in academia, I was, uh, I was always out working in industry as well. So either I was working on my PhD, but I was also working... Uh, and the same thing is true when I was teaching at LMU. I was a you know, founder CTO of two startups. Both did well, but both of them... Within a month of, you know, getting going, you know, we raise some funding, hire some developers and, you know, I kind of get it going in the right direction, but then I was heads down coding every day and I was a great coder, but I was like, I was so excited about the, the strategy, but once you kind of get it going, you don't get to do a whole lot of strategy. And I'm like, well, this is kind of crazy. So after having the exact same experience twice, I'm like, well, I'm really passionate about the strategy and I want to do that more how can I do that? And, and this was back in the 1997. So the, the sort of the dot com boom and everybody wanted to do a startup and I'm like, okay, well let me do three of these at a time. And so I started doing that and quickly realized, well, the next problem is I need a bunch of people to go build all this stuff and it takes the time to recruit people. And of course I tapped out, you know, my pipeline and I'm like, well, let me start to build up a staff. And I was a teacher and so I started hiring an ex-students students. and then hired a bunch of the people graduating. And so we actually started Tech Empower out of the lab at Loyola Marymount, the computer lab. And so it was over the summer. Uh, so, you know, we we're quietly doing it with just a few people during the, the spring semester. And then over the summer, pretty soon we had 10 people working out of the lab. Out of the lab. <laughs> at LMU. And, and one day, the, uh, so this is over the summer, so no one's, no one's around, right? And all of a sudden the department chair will, walks into the computer lab. He's looking around and he's like, tell me what's, what's going on here. And I'm like, well, I'm giving all these, these young gentlemen a, ch- a chance to, uh, you know, participate in some, some, you know, uh, work learning experience. Right. And they're getting paid good money. And, uh, he's, Oh, did, so you, d- you decided, okay, I'm just going to tell the truth. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, okay. You know, and, and he didn't say a word. He really, you know, I sort of respect him for not blowing his top or anything. And the memo came out a week later saying how there was no uh, commercial enterprises allowed in any any labs in, in the engineering school. And so we soon had to move out of it. But it, it was great. I, I mean, love and, it. I and, love and actually, several of the people who worked in the lab 
over that summer still work with me 21 wow, years later that is crazy yeah and so tech empower is is so is it safe to say it's an it's an agent dev agency it's, or a yeah so consultancy it's, a, it's cto consulting architecture consulting we do a lot of due diligence uh tech reviews when people hit an inflection point it could be i'm starting up a new project i have a team but we just got an a round and we need to sort of upskill i need to turn this situation around mm. and it could be anything from us being a interim CTO for a while to coming in to help supplement a team to doing, you know, full, full scale. You know, uh, you wrote, and I don't know if this is um, intentional or if you, if, if this is just part of your vernacular, but y when you describe your services for startup, startups, you called yourself fractional CTOs. And when you describe your services for larger enterprises, you describe you, you describe it as interim CTO. Mm -hmm. Did you do no, it on purpose? Not intentional. No, I, I use them sort of interchangeably. Okay, because I I, th I thought that that was a because I have a sort of a, a, a I want to talk to you about the term fractional CTO uh, and and kind of how you view it and 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 sort of what that really entails. Yeah. So so fractional just means you're not a full time. CTO, right? So you're coming in and you're spending a portion of your time. And so it, you know, it could be as much as 20 hours a week during in sort of inflection points, but it's, it's not going to be 40 hours a week. Uh, but you're doing all of the things you would need to do as a CTO. So you're figuring out the, well, what's the business and product strategy and what's the technology going to be to meet that? What's the team plan? What's the process? You get the, you know, the team organized around what the strategy is make sure you have the right people in place. And so you're doing all of what you would expect a CTO to do. Only truly most companies don't need, uh, if you're talking a strategic CTO, they don't need a full-time CTO. You have to grow to mm. a pretty big scale before mm. that really makes sense to do. Really early stage, you know, you'll hear about, okay, I need to, I need to go hire, I'm the you know, founder CEO that says, I need to go hire my CTO. Mm. And you talk to them and it's like, no, you need a tech yeah, lead. You need yeah, somebody on the, yeah. on the keyboard, right? You need a little tiny bit of strategy and then you need a lot of dev. And so coming in and being a fractional CTO, I think makes a tremendous amount of sense. The other aspect to it is it's also interim though, because you know, if, if, well, in eHarmony's case, so I was the, the interim fractional CTO for four years, right? From the founding to the, to when we raised 110 million. And once you've got 110 million in the bank, then you're going to, you know, like, they overnight our little tiny one and a half person dev team <laughs> was 15 people incredible and you know hire a cto in and you know build up the whole team and uh so since you brought that up um so for four years you were helping a team of founders or whoever they were to to fulfill that role of technology strategy and how to best implement product maybe oversee the development but you never joined as a co-founder or as a and and how did you make that decision because at some point you must have said, wow, man, this looks amazing. I, sh I should jump in while I can. Well, because um, uh, being an, uh, a fractional CTO for yep. four years, yep. hel help me understand that concept. Well, it, it's just, well, what does the company need, right? And so in eHarmony's case, uh, you know, I was the fractional interim CTO. Uh, Tech Empower actually did all of the dev for them. Mm. And they were always in a situation where it was like we'd go through the next product cycle, you'd staff up a little bit for it, and then you'd go down to a relatively small dev team that would, that would sort of maintain, do small amounts of work. The vast majority, after the initial, the initial build was maybe three and a half months, and after that initial build, there was tweaks trying to improve conversion numbers, but a lot of it was where do we spend, put our marketing spend mm. to be able to mm. sort of prove out that you know cost of acquisition, lifetime value numbers. <laughs> the lifetime value, you know, we could massage that a bit to improve that but most of it was about marketing spend mm. and so for many years we were spending all of our time you know i wasn't doing really a lot of cto stuff i'd sit down and look at see what they're doing on the marketing mm. spend where was it working where was it not working and we talk about things we could do on the product but they didn't need a, mm. a at, at some point at some point the product was there yeah and now you had to build a business yes exactly and i, and I, and I often in my own personal journey, I, if I look at the pie chart, uh, I've funded a few of my own ideas, which crashed spectacularly because I thought that by building the tech, I was building 90% of the company. And I realized that it's, it's 
probably directly inverted. By having built the tech, I've built 10% of the company. The rest has to come through sales and marketing, customer yeah. acquisition strategy, building the team, finding yep. funding, managing revenues. Yeah. yeah it's it, tough. It, it is. It, it always is. It's always way, way harder. So eHarmony, everybody, you know, I mean, at one point it was responsible for 5% of the marriages in the U.S., but uh, people... <laughs> People don't realize because you're asking like, you know, fractional versus jumping in full time, being, you know, uh, an equity player. Um, It wasn't obvious Mm. at any point until we sort of landed into radio on accident. Uh, We got picked up by this this syndicated radio program called Focus on the Family. And we'd been on Oprah and some other things and never got much of a blip from any of that. And Focus on the Family just hit exactly the right demographic. And we were inundated. Our, our systems were basically down to the, hey, we'll take your email and we'll get back to you later wow. kind of level because we, we just couldn't keep up with the, the flood. And like radio, wow, great. I mean, and, and in hindsight, it's super obvious we should have done that, but it wasn't obvious to us at all. We were trying all the digital channels, all these other things, and sort of just randomly ran into that. And then everybody knows them because, you know, radio and TV, they get, spend money very efficiently mm. there, acquire people, and so they grew spectacularly. <coughs> wow. So a demographic that placed a high premium on monogamous Long, long-term long-term relationships. Yep, exactly. Wow. And so I, I think that's an interesting perspective in the sense that you're right. At at no point in hindsight obviously it's like, wow, you know, eHarmony, blah, blah, blah. But you're right. Just you did your job, you built the te- you built the product. You did it as cheaply and as efficiently as possible. And then you sat in those uh, sort of strategic planning meetings to see and sync up on what was being done. And then boom, suddenly, suddenly focus on the family. Yeah. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly, you know, we're geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you have to, did you get sucked into the um, sort of the, the data science stuff as well? Or was that pre? No, this is really pre, yeah, pre-data yeah. science. It, data science wasn't even a term yeah. back then. Uh-huh. And it's funny because I, I know the when guy. When was that? Uh, let's see, probably 2001 through 2005, something like that. That term didn't exist. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and actually I know the guy now, uh, well, the guy who was the head of data science for eHarmony is now at uh, Zephyr. And, uh, and so he, he was talking to me about all the different stuff they were doing there. Uh, you know, they could predict based on a person's image, how likely this person was to, you know, to, uh, actually choose them as a match, just some amazing things. And it's so light years beyond anything we were doing way back in the day. And you're like, oh my God, just, it's just amazing. I mean, marketing spend analysis, uh, conversion, you know, uh, optimization, all that stuff is all, was all part of it now. Right. Yeah. And we were, we were back in the wow, stone ages. Wow. So th- back then, obviously no mobile strategy. There was nothing like that. Uh, unless you were doing it for, the Nokia phone, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, then uh, so th- it was basically a web app with backend. So I remember when I came to an LA, my last LA CTO forum, which was a while back. There was actually must have been someone through you who was <coughs> eHarmony's data data science team or something. Okay, yeah, and they did a presentation on how they were doing data oh, science. Okay, that's exactly the one. Yeah, the gentleman I was talking about, and and yeah, okay, and. and Probably he did a presentation then. Oh. So yeah, it was uh, again back to LA CTO forum. the The room was packed. People were, people just seemed happy to be there, man. Yeah, well, a few drinks will help too. <laughs> <laughs> the evening events uh, definitely it's more most of those people. So the tech empower. Uh, so so tell me about uh, is are, are your devs graduating from that, or uh, is it a, is it a traditional agency model where you have a bunch of people employed? Yeah, uh, are so, you scaling up and down as necessary, or is it just your team? No, I, I, we we scaled up a lot in the go go you know dot com era, and I sort of learned my lesson out of that. And so we we actually have been well, just a very slight growth path since two thousand two, basically. So we scaled up, scaled back, extremely painful, especially when you're hiring people who were former students and you have a personal committed sort of relationship to mm. them and to let somebody go, you know, cause I, we are extremely good people and I'd never want to see one of them walk out the door. And so we scaled back and have, you know, even through the 2008 
time frame we didn't have to let anybody go mm. and so it's it's a very you know sort of long-term employee model and it's part of what makes it great for me because i get to go work with you know innovators and they've got all these great things they want to do and i know that i've got a team mm. that you know once can i can execute on that yeah and it fun. also it also adds gravitas to your uh <laughs> To, to your ideas and your strategy, whatever you're whiteboarding, because you're like, hey, whatever I'm drawing, yeah, I can actually make it happen. So I'm not, I'm not just uh, billing my hours for circles and squares. I can actually do this for you. Yeah, absolutely. What is, uh, uh, so I love your earlier comment about a, a, a CEO founder comes to you and says, oh my goodness, I need a CTO, I, you know, this and this and that. And then I, or I'm in that situation where I often say to them, well, do you have wireframes? Have you thought through the problem set? Do you have a couple thousand dollars? Doesn't sound to me like you need a CTO. Um, what other things do you see, especially as a tech voice in the room and especially with your experience? What are you coaching CEO founders in the tech space on mostly? So I guess one standard piece of advice is get a, Let's say you don't need the CTO. Well, then it raises the question, what do I, what do I need, right? You probably need a tech lead. And if you are a non-technical CEO, you need a technical advisor. And you probably do, I'm guessing you do a fair yeah. bit of that, yeah. right? And so without having a technical advisor, you're basically you know, building a house without having an architect or a person to be well, able to even look. Yeah, to provide some oversight. Yeah, you're just, you're just hope, wishing and praying yeah. if you're non-technical. Yeah. And, and so... The technical lead is going to do the bulk of the work, but who's going to kind of look out for you and make sure that they're going in the right direction? It doesn't take a lot of time, and often you can get technical advisors uh, on an equity basis. And again, a lot of the CTO forum is very happy to, to do that. If it's a promising startup, I'm sure you get lots of inquiries from things that you go, well, gee, I've heard this 10 times before, and you know, like, you know, is this going to go anywhere? And then you're not going to spend time on it. But mm -hmm. if it's promising, then, then lots of CTOs are willing to spend time on promising opportunities. And so the technical advisor is like always an early piece of advice for somebody who's a non-technical founder, right? Trying to go through that process. What do I need, right? If it's a larger, well, if it's a sort of medium complex problem, you don't need a full-time CTO, but you need more than what you get out of a technical lead, then you might hire a fractional CTO mm -hmm. in. But that's still of the percentage of things out there there's there's a bunch of them that are I'd say eighty percent are not going to need even even a fractional CTO. You can technical advisor and a good technical lead uh, is is kind of the the you know the eighty percent mm. case. And then the twenty percent of them are a little more interesting. They're going to need a little more to it, or maybe in healthcare, and they've got some interesting security problems or mm. integration problems, stuff like that. Then then yeah, okay, you're going to need a little more like domain muscle. specific uh, experience. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any uh, advice for founders who are trying to identify advisors? Uh, is there a sort of a, a way to go about that? Because that, I'm assuming there's good advisors and bad, adv well, not good and bad, but I guess those that are just looking for, I mean, how, how do you, do founders, do you just, so let me, how you do it in LACTO forum? Do you put the word out that, hey, there's a founder, they want an advisor, who, who's interested, go talk to them? Yes, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. And then you just see, if, and then it's up to them to figure out the chemistry or yeah. just and and evaluate them, and uh, they'll ask my opinion on it. But honestly, for most of the CTOs, I've had like interactions like we've had, right? And so I've got some signals, but but I don't, I've never worked with you, so therefore I don't really know, mm. you know how it, just how good you're going to be in that role. Mm. I can I could have a conversation with you and try to vet that. But they can too. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. and you can look at somebody's track record and see that they've delivered at multiple startups, and mm. therefore you can mm. have some confidence like in it. So let's move on to Aggregate. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about that because it's a uh, yeah exciting times for the company. We actually just had a, a board meeting this morning, and uh, which, by the way, you're mentioning. <laughs> You 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 you're talking about my passion around the CTO forum. So I applaud your passion around doing this. So uh, yeah, you. it's it's impressive what you do here. So uh, so we had a board meeting uh, this morning, and uh, we we're talking about our 2018 results, and we we more than doubled our revenue in 2018 over 2017. 
And so, and actually maybe I should back up. What is aggregation? What is it? Yes. Yeah. So we, we believe we're the new model of uh, business media. So back in the day, if you're a professional, you were probably subscribed to one or two or three trade publications. Like we actually mentioned InfoWorld. Um, so InfoWorld back in the day, you might be subscribed to that and a few other um, print publications mm-hmm. that you'd get in the mail. And those publications really were never able to make the transition to online because the dollars you could get for print advertising just never, never translated for online. Um, and so what we do is we go into a vertical, we'll partner with a conference or an association, and we will, um, they've got a built-in audience. And if you're a conference, it's like, well, I have my annual <coughs> conference, but what do I do in between to provide value to my audience, right? And so we'll say, hey, great, we'll pull content together. We'll look at what the audience does with the content to figure out what they consider to be the most valuable of the content. And it'll all be very you know, domain specific. So if you're in supply chain, it's all about you know, supply chain management and what you do there if you're in e-learning or HR. And we have about uh, 30 verticals now. And we believe this will scale to uh, 1,000 verticals. Back in the day, there were 17,000 of these print publications. And, uh, and there's really, it's, well, it kind of as a, as a professional, it answers the question, um, you know, I know there's all these sources out there. There's all these blogs, all these trade publications or online publications. And, uh, you know, what, um, you know, how do I keep track of, you know, and if I could keep track of all of them, it would just flood me. So we pull it all together in one place and give you the very best stuff based on what the audience is saying is the best stuff. You also over time will indicate to it, here's your preferences about the specific content areas you're interested in. And so you get this great, um, you know, newsletter basically with all this amazing content each week or each day. And, and you can have it then branded as your, your thing, like your your conference brand or. Exactly. Exactly. So it's co-branded. So it'll be, you know, CTO universe brought to you by the LA CTO forum, or it'll be, um, human resources today brought to you by NCHRA, um, which is a big association in human resources. And, uh, and then the other part of the equation is we, um, you know, advertisers want to reach these professional audiences. And so we, we basically will run webinars on behalf of the advertiser or people who subscribe mm. or who yeah, register it's, it's for a, it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Now, I, are you behind CTO Universe? Yeah. Okay, I never knew that. I just went. Well, it, it launched in July okay. of this year. <laughs> I just went to it. Is that on the Aggregate platform? Yes. That is. is so slick. Oh, thank you very much. I awesome. I went I went to CTO Univ I subscribe I mean you completely had me. I checked all the boxes for whatever the dailies, the weeklies. Um but I was amazed. so I, I on your Twitter feed you linked to an article from it and and I clicked on it and I was like, "Oh jeez, this is this is a really slick publication." So much so that you I guess I completed your your you, conversion. That's that's an amazing testimonial of a conversion. Do you think? So I always wonder about those social media posts I make and whether anybody actually ever no, reads them I, or clicks on them. So, <laughs> I may, so there's at least one. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, what I do want to compliment you on is the the layout of the publication was so just. Thank you. Thank you very I much. Loved it. Appreciate it. I loved it. The mob programming image was broken, but. Seriously, what, what didn't display? Oh, that's very or maybe it didn't have an image. But well, uh, no, we actually if if a source doesn't have an image, we can use. We'll we'll stick our own on there. Yeah, so yeah. It's, so it'd be unusual just some, that it's broken. Just no, some that's, live on air feedback. Yeah, um, no, no. The layout and the actual look and feel was so professional that I was, boom, signed up in done. Thanks. Yeah, and, and the content like there was one this last week. Uh, the top article this last week, based on the audience, was on uh, data data architectures and data platforms, and it was a phenomenal piece by a former Spotify guy, and just talking about how they think about that. And yeah, that was so, actually so, the, so, the topic at the CTO forum. So. Well, well, yeah. So that's the tweet that led me to the article, oh, okay. that led me to the sign up, that led me to the more programming, that led me to Woody Zool's site, that led me to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't finish the internet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> finish the internet. So is it, is it, it how does one, so I've, I've seen a couple um, publications that try to, like I think Paper Lee or something was yep. one of them. Yep. Where 
I'm going to sort of take some, some uh, uh, you know, sort of liberal license here, but, but it kind of feels like a lazy way to assemble content. And I feel like mostly it's hit or miss. And I guess that's why I was so impressed with CTO Universe because I just look at, oh, geez, this is, this is all, this works. But yet yeah, that was the same model, right? You, 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 uh, not the same well, model. Well, no, no, no. Because, yeah, because Paperly, very interesting. <coughs> they got a lot of traction. I don't know what ever happened to them. But, uh, but basically they were, they were uh, based on social media purely. And it was very hit and miss of what you were going to get. Mm. And there would be lots of content that was great out there that they would just completely miss because it was wasn't in the feed. Or yes, in the, exactly. Yeah. And so we're taking a much broader swath of content aimed at the audience. And then we learn over time um, what signals high quality content. So you have these weird things where somebody will share stuff on Twitter. They've only got like 20 followers because they're followers in their company. And, uh, and so that's a VP of, of tech, let's say, and they're sharing just the very best stuff for their employees. And so if you just looked at follower numbers, you'd say, well, this is a non-person, but everything they share is spot on (laughs) because Mm. they care desperately about only sharing super high quality Mm. stuff. And so that becomes a really valuable signal to us. Anything this person shares, super high quality, like pay attention to them. Whereas somebody could have tens of thousands of followers and they just share sort of willy-nilly mm. stuff right and so um it it really does take a lot to figure out how to how to have the system mm. identify the very best content and are there. you doing sort of a publisher advertiser business model um sort of let's say i want to sign up for aggregate so i do an annual cto conference called 0111 okay uh I let's say I want to keep my people interested in all my attendees interested in yep. how do I sign up? What do I do? Like, yeah. So what's the in, business model? Well, if you're the original, if you're the, the, um, I'll call it the top level partner. Um, then they're, they're typically, um, a, a true partner in the site. Right. So they're, they're, um, bringing their audience to bear. We're bringing advertising to bear. We're going to share in the, in the benefits of that site. Um, we do a lot of other things that are media partnerships. So in the case of CTO, you, uh, CTO universe and you, there might be a really interesting cross promotion. Actually, we should absolutely be doing a cross promotion partnership with you, in which case then we can help promote you and you can help promote us. And, and so that's typically the relationship there. There can be all sorts of other things though we can do, like we can white label, uh, so you could create your own branded version of it. Um, so that you would, you would have your population in there, but then you have to, you're going to license that from us and you're going to need to sell your own advertising or, you know, you'll get the value back in terms of conference registrations. Yes. But the simple one is the media partnership. But if you've, I I don't know like what size your marketing list is, but you you could potentially do something on your own if you've got a big marketing Mm, list. Okay. Okay. But offline, let's, let's talk about the media partnership. I I, I would love to, (laughs) I, I would love any form of collaboration. Um. No, that's that's fascinating, Tony. Um, I uh, again, I'm, I'm I admire what you've done with the community up here, and uh, definitely want to help you. You know, figure out what I can do down in San Diego for you. And yeah, well, we we need to. Um, well, it's almost uh, quitting time, so we can go out and go have some beers, and we should we should sit down sometime and talk about how we can help that. each other. I would yeah. love that. So uh, to wrap up, um, you posted a very interesting. Uh, survey result on your blog, socalcto.com. And uh, it's, it's an interesting thing because at, at seven CTOs, we're also, because we have so many people meeting, you know, for four hours a month, we also have a deep insight into what people's top challenges are. And okay. I was, it was interesting for me to correlate the lists. Oh, I'd be, yeah, I'd be very curious. The yeah, and, uh, and uh, it's interesting, the, our number one uh, issue, so I think, what you found from your survey result was that the number one issue was hiring. Recruiting, yep. Recruiting. Our number one issue was financing and financial. So in many ways, it's like, well, how do we, uh, how, as CTOs, how do we work on the process of raising money, understanding money, okay. um, uh, in, in some ways, understanding the, the, the business trend of sort of if the startup is, is – or, or whatever size is in, is in healthy shape or mm-hmm. is in bad shape. 
because it's 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 hard to it's hard to know if you're spending a buck to make a ninety nine cent pencil. Right? <coughs> yep. Yep. Um, and then the second one was 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 which was in your top five was um, personal time management. Okay, which surprised me. Uh, I actually, I mean, of course, you've been part of this interview. I'm obviously horrible at personal time management. <laughs> I'm involved in way too many things, and the next one comes, and I'm excited about it. So, uh, so I'm really horrible about it. But uh, I was actually surprised that that was a general issue yeah, for CTOs. Yeah. So it's in your top five as well. It's in my top five, and then the um, the third one, if I remember correctly, was a the the, the 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 third one and the very close third one was hiring, okay, recruiting, and then managing snowflake engineers, like okay, people who are on the mission critical path, but are you know yep a holes. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if we gave them an option of that uh, in our in our survey. So, uh, you know, man, you know, managing was definitely one. Of, I'd say it was probably in the top ten. We had security was a big one. Oh yes, uh, appropriate security was a big one. So it's it's hey, how do I decide? I mean, there's a million things I can do. If I call in a security consultant, I'll get a list. You know, mm. a mile mm. long, right? If anything, I've just created liability for myself. You know, and so uh, it, it's. It's like, what do I really need to do mm. here? What are other CTOs mm. really doing? Um, uh, let's see. Oh, business. Well, actually, it relates to one of the things you said. So, uh, so it sounds like you've got a lot of founder CTOs. Uh, ours, ours was business metrics. Yeah. So it was, I still want to know like what I can do to enable the organization and how I need to tie what we're doing as an engineering team to the to the business metrics. The, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and and make sure we're contributing appropriately. And at the same time, there's always this tricky thing of um, how do you sort of, you know, are you just a service organization sort of, so the, the business is dictating to you what you're doing as the CTO and you're just shipping bits and, and that's how they perceive you. And so any credit for success is, well, that's what the product told you to mm. build, right? Versus are you an innovation sort of center mm. for the organization? And so are you going to create value that way? And so, yeah. And, I, and I think one of the, t one of, not the top five, but maybe it was, was your, that executive presence. Yes. Was on your list. Yep. Pretty high Pro up. Probably like six or something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. And um, yeah, that, that's a, that's a big thing we see as well with, um, we often talk about being a first class citizen of the C-suite uh, because you do have that problem. And, and, and oftentimes when I talk to CTOs, I can tell very quickly that they're not viewed as first class citizens of the C suite because like you said they uh, are simply told what to do and then you execute and then the credit or the metric is satisfies a different department's yep. Um, yep. goals. And so oftentimes coaching CTOs into well listen this is this is this is really what should be happening in your strategic meetings. That's 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 a great one. Maybe we should talk about uh coming up and doing a presentation on I that. I would love that. Tony, I know that you came from a board meeting. Did you drive or did you walk? Here? Yeah. Uh, it's it's a, probably 10 did blocks away. No, it was it was raining, so I, I, I took uh, my car. Yeah. Thanks for coming out of a successful board meeting to be spend time with me in the dying moments of today. <laughs> and thanks for being in the CD studio. <laughs> it, was, it was fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Tony. Cheers. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Hi, thank you for listening to the CTO Studio. If you don't mind, take a quick second and please rate and review the show. It helps us a lot. Go to thectostudio.com for more information on what we're doing at 7CTOs. We also have a video or two for you that could be a helpful resource for you as you're managing your company. So thank you for listening.